Okay, so we're back to do another daily video for reptile education during the lockdown. And today we are going to do tortoises. And he's probably got his face behind a bowl, so it's hard for you guys to see. But this is the tortoise everybody always asks us about. This is our African spurred thighed tortoise, Hal. They're also called sulcatas. And I'll try and get him to walk closer to the camera. So I wanted to bring out the tortoises because everybody likes giant stuff and they're cool. But we also have um, several smaller tortoises and people quite often think that they're Hal's babies. And they are not. They are all adults in our collection. But the tortoise size difference is really, really variable. So they look... Here, I'll just pour it out for you. You don't want to get it out of the bowl. There. They look quite different. Quite similar, actually, but the sizes are hugely different. So spur thigh tortoises are from the southern edge of the Sahara. They're an African grassland species. This is the third largest species of tortoise in the world. It's the largest mainland species of tortoise in the world. The other two species are the Galapagos and the Aldabra tortoises, and they're a result of island gigantism. So they all live on really remote islands, and they didn't have anything to be their predators and to slow down their growth rate, and so they evolved into really gigantic creatures in very small populations. And the reasons that tortoises like those ended up now being fairly rare and endangered is because they did have small populations of huge tortoises. When we came and tried to eat them, it made it really simple for us, and it was hard for those small populations to recover. So spur thigh tortoises are one of the most common pet tortoises in the United States, um, which is a little weird because they're so humongous. They are no longer imported into this country. So if you find a baby one, it is almost certainly captive bred in the U.S. Um, that's a really good thing when it comes to the pet industry, but I actually stuck the Friends of Scale Reptile Rescue sign behind us today. Um, specifically because it's kind of a weird thing to have in the pet industry. Um, having the third largest species of anything in the world be a common pet seems like an odd trend. Um, and it is. There are lots of people that are able to keep them their whole lives. Most of them live in the southern part of the United States where you can keep them outside year round. We don't live there and even today it's very cold and he cannot be outside. So we actually have half a horse stall built inside of our shop that he lives in during the winter time. Um, and that is something that they need. They need a serious amount of space. They require a very large amount of food and a very serious hot spot. And they still need their UV lights. So everything about having giant pets is also giant. Food, lighting, heating, everything. Um, they became such a common pet because they're actually awesome. They're super curious. They're easy to care for other than the large size. What, they're, what he's eating, it's not just dog food. This is Missouri tortoise diet. This is a compressed grass pellet. So they should eat a lean, dry grass diet. Are you trying to sniff my fingers? I'm sorry, here, I can't really hand that to you. It's too little. Um, you don't want a ton of moisture in their diet and you don't want a ton of sugar. So fruit for these guys is just a treat. But tortoises are just like kids and they always want treats and they don't want to just eat their grass and hay. Um, in the summertime, we keep him outside as long as it's above 50 at nighttime. He does need some place that's a little more humid to hide in the heat of the summer. Um, so he hides in our shed. We leave the bottom of it open about this tall and he can crawl under and have a cool space to be in there. If you don't provide that, they will dig a burrow. Um, part of that spur thigh name, can you guys see that from back there? His spurs right here? Mm -hmm. So he sits like this and he can pull those spurs in and cover his face, right? Because the only thing that's even a little bit soft on him is his wrinkly old man neck skin right here. So that he wants to protect that. Sorry, here, I'll make a bigger pile. There, eat that. So he pulls those spurs in and covers his face, but that's also how he digs. So he pushes his head into the dirt 
and then swims that dirt all the way out of the way because he needs to be able to turn around when he gets to the bottom of the burrow and then back himself in and cover back up. And that's what makes the door to his burrow so that nothing can get to his neck, right? Because that's the part that's dangerous for him. Those spurs are very, very thick. So if we talked in some other videos about bird feet and cat claws flicking at things, even really big cats like lions. So if a lion were to flick at that spur, he can take that with that claw, that little scratch across there. That claw is just scratching against his spurs. He can't take it across that flappy neck skin, right? So he's gonna hang out and eat, which I think means he might actually stay in one place. So you wanna hand me the Greek or the Russian? He's actually eating. So, two of our other really common pet species that hopefully become more common and maybe spur thighs become less common are a Greek tortoise and a Russian tortoise. So, Russian tortoises are super common pets in our country, and Greeks are getting there. Um, this is a plain old Greek tortoise. Greek tortoises come from all over the area around Greece, uh, actually down across the Mediterranean into Libya and over toward Turkey, and they get into some really cool golden colors. So a lot of the different places that Greek tortoises come from have become really popular as pets. Russian tortoises have been popular pets for a really long time um, because they're readily available and they're really outgoing. So they have a lot of the same personality traits that spur thighs do. They're really cool little dudes. They like to run around and do their own thing. Hal's done eating, so he's gonna ignore us and probably try to leave. Go ahead. He can walk. So these guys are two of the ones that get confused as Hal's babies really often. These are actually full grown adult tortoises. Are you going to sit right where I was sitting? Yes. Okay. I'll move you. Nope. No. So all of these tortoises, when they're born, are about the size of a golf ball right? And in most tortoise species, the first 10 years of their life, they grow pretty rapidly. And then from there on, it kind of slows down, but it does continue for the entirety of their lives. One of the things about these guys is if you look, can you guys see? Everybody is kind of built the same, just like Hal was, right? The spurs aren't quite as big, but those legs look pretty similar and those big old claws for digging and then when he ducks his face in, he can use those legs to cover, right? So all the ideas are generally the same. The Russian tortoise is built a little more like our native box turtles, but much thicker, right? And they are much more tolerant of cold than any of the rest of these guys because of the grasslands that they live in are really expansive across Russia, so they have a very large temperature variation. Are you going to eat some of that too, or are you going to ignore it? Nope, I'm just going to walk through it. So part of the reason tortoises have always been really popular pets is a vast majority of the species are really outgoing. They're not scared of us. They're very food-centered, and so they start to learn that people mean food. Don't try to eat my blue shoelaces. Um, they are very color-oriented because they do like that sugar. They like target training because red things usually mean strawberries when it comes to our shop. Um, and they're really easy to station train because of that food-centered life. Right? What are you doing? Same thing? So, the kicker to that is they all have very similar diet requirements and that what they should actually get is lean, high grass content, dry diets. Until you get into something like a Russian tortoise is a little bit different because it is a little more grassland box turtle. And then we're going to talk about some tortoises from South America that are quite a bit different because where they're from, it's much more humid. But where a lot of these guys are from, it's very, very dry. So, so what are you doing? Hal's going to push me out of the way here in a minute. Um, one of the big mistakes that people make is people think that hot means dry. And that's not necessarily true. So if you think of a tortoise 
having claws and a shell and that growing the way that your fingernails grow. Am I in your way? I'm sorry. Yeah, it's there too small for this. I know, I'll move. So if you think of a oh, here, let me accommodate you. If you think and see the <laughs> Russian charge him. the Russian oh, doesn't care at all. She's gonna come right at him and tell him to get out of the way. Come on, I'll pick you up because he's just gonna step on your head. Come here. <laughs> That's what's cool about Russians, they don't care. They'll come after anybody. Um, if you think about a tortoise shell growing the same way that your fingernails do, your fingernails are a really easy way to determine your health, right? If you are dehydrated or you're not getting the right kind of vitamins or you have certain illnesses, it becomes really obvious in your fingernails and hair. It's a, a really quick way for people to tell some of those things. And tortoises can work in a similar fashion. So in where we live in Illinois, it gets cold in the wintertime, so we have to provide him for supplemental heat. He has to come inside. However, it also gets really, really dry, right? Everybody experiences that in their house usually. So we have to keep, make sure he doesn't dry out with that heat. So he needs a little bit more humidity than you would think that he would need, being from below the Sahara. Because there, it's a fairly constant environment. It isn't changing the way that ours is. What he's really worried about is too much heat there and he'll burrow to get into the cold and wet dirt, right? So we need to make sure that we provide that. And for the little guys, it's even more important because when you're smaller, like we talked about with the spiders, it's easier for you to overheat or cool off or de dehydrate faster because you're littler. So the two little tortoises that we had were mostly smooth, right? The Russian tortoise had a couple of little bumps, but he's actually meant to be that way. The Greek tortoise was almost totally smooth and had little flares where the, her shell came out. Hal still has some flares, right? He flares up a little bit. So in spur thigh tortoises and a lot of the really large tortoises, what that helps you to tell is what part of their environment they're from. So if they he didn't have a shell that flared up, he would probably be looking down to eat things on the ground. When you have that flare, He's picking flowers and small green things off of bush type and little shrubs, something like this tall. He can look up and grab those things because his shell is allowing him to. Can you guys see the bumps from back there? Okay, so Hal also has what we call pyramiding. Are you gonna walk toward the girls or? Nope, just stepping on your food. So pyramiding means that his shell is not smooth. I'm not gonna let you run into them. Milana's wearing orange shoes, so he's walking toward her. Um, Hal's shell is not smooth, and pyramiding happens for a variety of reasons, the vast majority of which is humidity for most times, and it can happen with nutrition as well. Um, we adopted Hal when he was 10, and he had pretty much the same amount of pyramiding. It hasn't gotten any worse, um, but it will never go away, so his shell will always look like that. When they're young, it is something that is fixable, but they have to be really, really little. In the same way for people. If you grow up and have a funny spot in one of your bones or you have an oddity in your fingernails, it doesn't always go away. Sometimes it can, but not always. So the way Hal looks is permanent. And then this particular part, where it looks like, see there's a scale here and a scale here, and then that scale looks funny. Can you guys see that on camera? So that is actually most likely due to a temperature variation or an environmental variation when he was still in the egg. So that's a developmental thing. It doesn't affect him. It hasn't hurt him in any way and he's not sick, um, but it makes him look funny. So he has a very a variable scale right there. Oh, he's just showing you his butt. And can you guys also see the butt? So he does have a tail and it's tucked up in here, and that's what protects him, because that skin would be soft, just like his neck, so he wants to keep himself safe. And actually, you guys can see his back feet pretty good, right? Mm -hmm. So, his back feet are sitting the same way my hands are sitting next to him, flat like an elephant. So a lot of people, when we go and do uh, talks about tortoises, or we include the tortoises in our shows, there's always somebody that says turtle, and then somebody's really quick to correct them that it's not a turtle, it's a tortoise. So, I will tell you guys, everything with a shell is a turtle. 
tortoises are a specific kind of turtle. And then terrapins are also a specific kind of turtle. If you actually look it up in the literature, it's they're all considered common verbiage and common names. If you say turtle, it means something with a shell, and we all know what you're talking about. However, most of the time, tortoises are things that live full-time on land and have limbs that go in columns. So they come straight out, and he's being lazy and kind of letting his arms sit so he can get down to the food. But his back feet are sitting flat like an elephant, right? A turtle is typically considered to be a shelled creature in the same order as tortoises, but they are fully aquatic and they swim, right? But I just said that when he digs his burrow, pulls those spurs in and pushes out. So he does have the same structures and he can do the same thing. That just isn't how he gets himself around in the world. He walks. See how he's pushed himself up now because he wants to walk over my leg? He walks with flat feet. A turtle can walk like that, but it's very awkward for them to do it and they usually don't do it very long. They kind of push themselves along and they want to get in the water because the majority of their body structure is made to swim. They are fully aquatic. So tortoise just means a special kind of turtle. Everyone knows what you mean when you say turtle. It is a shelled creature. So Clark, and they don't like to fly, so. <coughs> you gonna sit or are you gonna run? There's food if you want food. So this is Clark. Clark is another kind of tortoise. Clark is a, oh, food. Clark is a red-footed tortoise from South America. So he, oh, are you getting it? He is just like the other guys, a little bit larger than the two we saw that compared to Hal's babies that aren't babies, right? They're adults, but quite a bit smaller than Hal. So red-footed tortoises are from South America, which is a weird thing to say when we just talked about all these tortoises need dry diets and dry grasses and all of these things. And they live in the southern part of the Sahara and then the around the Mediterranean and the rocks and then these grasslands in Russia, like that's not anything like what we think of South America in our heads. So these guys live in a huge variety of habitats in South America. South America is a gigantic area and has many different habitats. And these are able to inhabit quite a few of them. Um, they're incredibly variable, but the one thing they almost always have in their environment is more humidity than the other guys. So he's a little bit bumpy, but it's not affecting his health. He's a little bit bumpy for the same reason that Hal is. His bumps just look different because it happened at a different stage in his life. So he didn't have enough humidity, and then just like your fingernails, his shell grew a little bit funny. We fixed that, and so he'll always look like that, right? But red and yellow foot tortoises are also really variable depending on what country in South America they come from, this could be your average size adult, or three times this could be your average size adult. So because their range is so variable, so too are their sizes, the amount of red that's on them, the amount of red that's on their head. Sometimes they have ones called cherry heads. They're typically from Brazil and they're also very small. There are also yellow foots that are similar to red foots, except yellow foots. We've talked about scientists not being very original. They have red or yellow feet, but that's the difference. And then cherry heads literally just have red heads. But if you get yellow foots and sometimes red foots from Bolivia, they're humongous. Big giant tortoises, right? This would look like a juvenile for them. Whereas for a plain old red foot from Guiana or Suriname, that's just your normal size adult. It's a football with colorful feet and a funny head. And just like the other tortoises, very personable. They like to come out, check out people. They're very food centric. They're not scared of us. The only thing you do have to worry about for some tortoises is the big guys like Hal, 
can be destructive and they also can be um, aggressive toward dogs. So that is an issue um, that in the wild dogs are a predator of theirs and they defend themselves by ramming things. So if you do keep a very large tortoise, um, we introduced our dog to Hal 10 plus years ago. Um, we, we, Hal doesn't have any aggression toward dogs and our dog has seen all kinds of animals so he doesn't care. But that is something to bear in mind that if it's a new animal to your home and you start out with a big one, um, they can be very aggressive toward dogs. Um, they can also be really aggressive toward males of their own kind. Boys will always fight over girls, almost any reptile species. So that's something always to be aware of. I know you want to keep going toward them. Um, being, yeah, wiggle your fingers. He's going to come at you even faster. Um, being a South American species, he is even more heavily interested in bright colors. He's, of course, walking on very bright green carpet, but he really likes Milana's orange shoes and yellow shirt, and now he's going to track right toward Indy because she's got bright red inside of her black sweater. Um, they do eat a little bit more meat. They do eat a little bit more fruit. Um, these are much closer in diet, environment, and temperament to North American box turtles than to your standard tortoise pet. Yeah, eat that. That's better for you, even though you don't want to. Oh, you eat one? Nope, spit it out. Okay, we'll do Franklin last. So this one actually doesn't like us very much. I know. You tell him. Get him. So this is Franklin, our gopher tortoise. And Franklin is very special because gopher tortoises in this country are a federally protected species. Franklin was found in the driveway of one of the zoos here in Illinois. And he was covered in spray paint. Let's see if I can turn him around. I know. Here, sit back so you guys can keep your light. Can you guys see the blue in the shell there on the video? Mm-hmm. So I don't know if you guys behind the other side of the screen can see, but in the lines of the shell here, Franklin has a little bit of blue. So that's remnants from paint. Franklin was spray painted over his shell, uh, we think, to mask what he really is. Um, lots of people go on vacation in the American Southeast, specifically to Florida. Um, there are two problems. People think that they are sea turtles and then put them in the ocean where they fairly quickly drown because they are not sea turtles, they are tortoises. Um, the other problem is that people bring them home, thinking that they're similar to <coughs> our box turtles and they are not. Um, these animals are a keystone species for longleaf pine forests. And keystone species just means that that is an animal that is inordinately impactful on the place that it lives. So gopher tortoises dig humongous burrows. They average 32 feet. And the number of species that have been found to share that burrow with them is at least 360. Um, that means that the longleaf pine forest, which in itself, that just that environment is threatened in our country. So the existence of the entire type of environment is rare. That environment is hugely aided by the availability of these tortoises. Because they dig those giant burrows, those burrows are then home to things that help that environment succeed. Lots of little pollinators, things that move seeds, all of the little guys that need places to hide. They can go hang out in that 30 plus foot burrow and it doesn't impact a guy like Franklin at all. He's sitting down at the end avoiding everyone. He doesn't care. The flip to that is that the soil that is created by that type of forest is very important to Franklin because that's what makes him able to dig such a gigantic burrow and have it hold its shape, hold its humidity, create the microclimate that keeps him healthy, 
and create that variant of microclimate as you go down deeper into the burrow that keeps everybody else healthy who shares the burrow with him. So the reason that we believe he was painted is to hide what he was because taking Franklin out of the wild and then crossing state lines with him is actually a federal offense. It's considered animal trafficking and it's a major fine. Um, it's something that technically on paper you can go to prison for. It's a really big deal. Um, Franklin can never go back into the wild because now that he's been exposed to zoo life and other animals, we don't know that if he's carrying something that could make wild gopher tortoises sick. And because they're already endangered, we definitely don't want to introduce new diseases to them. Franklin also couldn't stay at the zoo that he was dropped off at because they already had a gopher tortoise and the two of them didn't get along. So part of the problem with endangered species is one, they're rare, but two, that conservation and endangered species are the point of zoological institutions. But you can get overcrowded with endangered things because this process, are you gonna try and burrow under there? The process and structure in place to reintroduce endangered animals back into the wild is very complicated and it's a very long process. So that makes it difficult when you start to get too many things. Um, we're a smaller organization. It's a little bit easier for us to get out into the public. So the zoo offered Franklin to us as an educational animal and then they kept theirs for their educational programs. And now he hangs out with us and teaches people about endangered environments and threatened animals in our country. He's still not super sure about people, but he are, I mean, he has that standard tortoise attitude. He's very outgoing, wants to see what's going on, wants to go try to eat stuff, look at Milana's orange shoes. <laughs> Everybody likes the orange shoes. <sighs> yes, I know you love your orange shoes. Get them. But you can see a lot of the same structures as the very first big guy, right? We're walking flat on our hands. We've got a little bit of spur going on here. If we want to ram somebody, we got our shell sticking out. When something happens, I duck my head in and I can cover with my feet. All of those structures are the same, right? We've just changed where in the world we're from, and that's changed a little bit about how our shell looks in the shape, but that's about it. And then compared to some of the other guys, he's very, very smooth. But one of the cool things about gopher and desert tortoises is these are one of the few species where you can count the rings and know their age, which is something that we weren't aware of. Um, we had a desert tortoise turn into us some time ago, and we deal with the Illinois Department of Natural Resources. So they permitted us for the gopher tortoise. And then when things come into the rescue or come to us that require permitting or licensing, um, we refer all those things back to the state and then we go through their process with them. So they were teaching us how to determine the age of the tortoise that was in our care while we were waiting to find the owner and they were determining all the licensing and paperwork. So that was really cool. Um, people ask us all the time if, you know, for the spur thigh and the really big guys, if you can determine their age based on the rings like a tree, and you really can't. Um, the reason that we know Hal's age is because we personally know the people that we adopted him from and I know what age he was when we got him. So other than that, all the other rescues are a guess. We just know that they're adult size and they're sexually mature so you can guess their minimum age. Um, but like I said before, everybody grows really fast till you're about 10 and then you kind of slow down and grow at a slower rate for the rest of your life. When it comes to lifespan, a lot of people ask us about the tortoises and they think that they're a hundred or, you know, super old. Um, they're actually not. Hal is 20. Um, Franklin is 32, right here? Something like that, yeah. 32 or 33, I'd have to recount. Um, in captivity, most tortoises are in the 50 to 70 year range. They can go an extremely long time. Um, the oldest tortoise in captivity right now is Jonathan, and he's over 180 years old. I encourage everyone to Google him. His story is amazing. Um, the difference being that Jonathan is one of the island giant species. So typically gigantic things 
either, <laughs> he's trying to get Milana's shoe, either have very short lives, kind of like dogs where big dogs don't live as long, or they live a very long time because to get so gigantic, they have to grow and grow and grow and it just takes a long time. I'll get them. I know you don't like to fly. And that is actually the part that I'm going to end on. Tortoises are an awesome pet. They are not an awesome pet to handle. Um, they are tanks. Tanks aren't made to fly. The problem with tanks is that we often drop them. So they are great pets in that they will react to you for food. They will follow you around. They have great personalities. They do their own thing and dig burrows and walk around your yard. We garden to help feed our tortoises and Hal stays out in the backyard all the time. He's always walking around, knocking stuff over, eating dandelions. Um, so for an outdoor social type of pet, they're great. Um, definitely not a sit on your lap and watch TV pet. So that's what we got for tortoises. If you guys have any questions, just let us know. Um, we can get them out, play with more. At some point, we're going to do one about different types of box turtles here in the U.S., so there'll be more shelled creatures to come, and we'll have another video tomorrow. Bye.